Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to The Currents, the North Central Region Water Network's speed networking webinar series. My name is Ann Nardi, and I'll be the facilitator for today's session. For those of you who aren't familiar with, you, with us, the North Central Region Water Network is a 12-state extension-led collaboration that is working to support water resource professionals and steward water resources across the North Central Region and beyond. Uh, the current is now in our 10th year. Uh, we are fast approaching our 100th edition of the current webinar series, and it is a speed networking webinar series. So we feature two to three speakers on a water-related topic that give a taste of their work uh, to better connect colleagues and better provide access to water resource programming and outreach across the region. I'm excited for today's topic. We're going to be uh, featuring citizen science programs and talking about how citizen science programs are putting that data to use. Citizen science is a key avenue for us in terms of engaging uh, citizens, uh, youth, or um, other professionals uh, in water-related topics. And uh, one of the things that we think is really interesting is highlighting the different ways that citizen science is being used to better inform our work uh, moving forward. All right, so a few housekeeping items before we dive in. We will have a Q&A session after both presenters speak, so please submit your questions for the presenters in the Q&A panel. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. It should say Q&A. Uh, there is an option in the Q&A panel to upvote other questions that folks ask, so please use that feature. We will um, have Q&A after both of our presenters today, and we will try to get to those questions that are the most popular first. So if someone else asks a question and you have a very similar one, uh, please upvote that, and we'll make sure to uh, answer those questions first. If you are having any technical issues, uh, you can use the chat. Uh, we are happy to help out. If you have any other questions about the North Central Region Water Network, uh, that's a great avenue. Or if you'd like to introduce yourself or share any kind of commentary on today's uh, talks in terms of citizen science programs in your states, et cetera, please do that via the chat. Um, and you can also, um, I will put a link in the chat to the northcentralwater.org. That is where we will have the webinar recording from today's session, as well as the PowerPoint slides. So you can uh, find that on um, northcentralwater.org, and I will put that link in the chat for you. If you are having any audio issues, um, you can uh, switch to phone. You can cl uh, click next to the mute icon and uh, right click and select switch to phone audio in case you're having any uh, issues hearing today. All right, so I mentioned today, we're gonna be talking about two citizen science programs and we have two great speakers lined up for you. Uh, Michelle McGrath is gonna be first. She's gonna be talking, she's with the National Weather Service and is gonna be talking about the COCO Roz program. And then we have um, Alba Algeric, uh, who is an assistant professor at the University of Missouri and is gonna be talking about the Lakes of Missouri volunteer program. So without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce uh, Michelle McGrath. Uh, she is the observing program leader at the National Weather Service, uh, and she's located in Minnesota. Um, she has been working with the National Weather Service since 1994 and knows a lot about the Coco Ross program, as well as has examples of how that data has been used, as well as other citizen science or weather observer um, programs in Minnesota. So I'm excited for her to talk a little bit about that program and how that data is being used by the National Weather Service. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to you, Michelle. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, joining you today to share information about the Kokoro's network. Um, let me go ahead and start with the first slide here of the presentation. Um, I'm located in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, working for the National Weather Service here at the Forecast Office. And um, today I want to talk about uh, an overview of what Raz is and the types of observations that are available, um, how the National Weather Service and our partners in Minnesota use Raz data, Kokoraz is the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. It's a nonprofit organization. Uh, it's basically volunteers across the country, uh, and they use low-cost measuring tools to share precipitation, snow, and other um, information 
through a very user-friendly website. Uh, the website itself also posts all of the observations that Kokoraz observers um, take and provides training to observers um, on the website as well. And um, the data that comes from the network, um, high quality data, and it's used by several different uh, organizations, networks, um, academia, um, education. And I'm gonna share some examples today about how those observations are used. First, I wanna share a little bit about the origins of Coco Raz. Um, Coco Raz started in Colorado after a devastating flash flood in 1997 in Fort Collins. Uh, the um, Colorado State University was studying the storm and here's a precipitation map from their study of that um, event. They went across the community looking for precipitation reports. The official climate stations uh, for the National Weather Service are spaced about 20 miles apart across the, the US. So when there's um, events that happen in a very small area, um, you may not completely sample um, what's occurred with the event. They went across the city and they found lots of people um, that were taking measurements. Some of them were weather enthusiasts or gardeners or other organizations that had precipitation data, which they compiled into this map. And, and they thought there's got to be a way that we can set up a network or a way for those people to share in, um, their precipitation measurements because they're so helpful to so many people. So that's kind of the origin of, of Kokoraz. Um, today, Kokoraz has grown from Colorado to become nationwide. It has a network of 20,000 observers across the country that are providing this type of information. In Minnesota specifically, there's over 1,500 um, active observers, and each of those data points on the map uh, show where the observers are located. It's pretty easy to call out the metro area of Minneapolis-St. Paul there with the density of reports. Um, but we are so excited to have so many people out in, um, in more rural areas of the state that are also reporting. Data has been available from Kokoraz back to 2009 in Minnesota. Some of the observations that are available from Kokoraz observers include 24-hour precipitation, uh, snowfall, and the current snow depth. And most observers take observations around 7 a.m. each morning. There's some special reports that Kokoraz observers can provide. Uh, snow cores are especially valuable up here in the northern part of the region um, for the winter snowpack, the SWE, the water content. Um, we also have um, the ability for observers to send in spotter lake reports where they can do when they're having a, a heavy rain or flooding, a blizzard, hail, any other type of weather events that are adversely affecting their community, they can report through Kokoraz. And there's also the condition monitoring report. Um, those are especially helpful right now because Minnesota is in a drought. So um, people can provide eyewitness reports as Kokoraz observers of how the local impacts have been with the dry conditions. And of course, that also applies when um, wetter than normal conditions are in play. What's great about Kokoraz is it's low cost equipment that is being used for the routine observations. To the right is a picture of the Kokoraz rain gauge. It's a four inch diameter plastic rain gauge. Um, meets National Weather Service standards, measuring to the hundredth of an inch. That's high capacity. And it, um, you can also, with the snow measurements, the low cost tools of um, a snowboard that can be from plywood and a, a ruler. Here's a, a specific look at the rain gauge used by Kokoraz. It's used by all of, of the Kokoraz observers across the country for consistency. Um, it can hold up to 11.3 inches of precipitation, measures to the hundredth of an inch. And the cost is about $35 for the gauge. Looking across the nation, just to give an example of the density of reports on the left-hand side, the national map, I picked um, December 26. That's what these um, maps are from, because in Minnesota, we had a very uh, unusual event. We had a um, heavy rain event on Christmas Day, which was reported the following morning by the observers, the 24-hour reports, one to two inches of rain. It was specifically um, important to us because we are in a drought, so that, that rain was so beneficial, and we were so grateful for the density of reports. An example of organizations that use Kokoraz data across the country, it varies from the local level, county level, state, federal agencies, um, and uh, other groups um, use this data for um, educational purposes as well. There's some examples on the right of some of the, um, using the data for um, 
or education or research. On the left are some of specific groups that um, are known to use COCOR as data. This is definitely not an exhaustive list, but just kind of an example of the wide variety of organizations, including the National Weather Service that use COCORAS data. And I'm gonna provide some specific examples of the use of the data. So um, for climate even, uh, precipitation data, because it's taken with um, instruments that meet um, standards, climate standards. Um, if an observer for COCORAS has over 10 years of records, it can be included in the precipitation climate normals from NCEI. Um, after a COCORAS observer has 100 observations, they, their data is also archived at NCI with the national climate records. Uh, obviously, input for drought and flood-related indices, such as the U.S. Drought Monitor, uses the people that provide input from the states will use the precipitation data. Other indices like soil moisture, fire danger, and even flash flood guidance use that type of data. FEMA will use precipitation and snowfall data for uh, weather-related disaster declarations, and also the USDA for agricultural programs. Uh, up in Minnesota, the Springfield Outlook is a, uh, a very um, highly used product, and um, the snow cores and the snowfall and the precipitation over the winter from COCORAS observers are incorporated into that, as well as year-round river forecasts. Um, of course, that higher density of measurements is, is very applicable to water resource management. Just a quick um, list of where you can um, get COCORAS data in addition to the COCORAS website. Um, NCEI database, it's archived there. Also, the regional climate centers have COCORAS data. And um, those that use uh, MADIS, uh, NOAA's MADIS data feed, um, it is also available in that data feed. This is an example from MRCC, the Midwest Regional Climate Center, of, of how um, COCORAS data adds that additional uh, detail. On the left-hand side, this is the Chicagoland area, and it shows all the COCORAS reports that were available on this particular day. Um, they made a map um, with all of the data sources with, except for COCORAS on the top right. And then when you add those COCORAS data, um, it, you can see the density um, gets very high, much higher. You can see even the, the maximum amounts are showing up there with over six inches of rain in a small portion of a county. Um, so it really helps to fine tune the areas that are affected by precipitation. In Minnesota specifically, there are several um, agencies at the county, local, and state level that use COCORAS data. There's a, a, a list here of some of the um, organizations that we partner with, and um, it's used for um, mitigation, planning, um, resource management, day-to-day uh, -day operations, and uh, modeling. Um, that's uh, some of the uses that, that these organizations um, take in that precipitation data. And I'm gonna provide some specific examples from a few of these organizations. Uh, for Minnesota, um, one, one thing we get asked a lot, um, Minnesota was the 49th state to join COCORAS, and that was back in 2009. And why were we one of the last states to join? Um, Minnesota had a pre-existing backyard um, precip network that started in 1970. It's called MinGage, and it is uh, managed by the uh, Minnesota State Climatology Office. And there's about a thousand MinGage observers across Minnesota and contributing organizations to this network. Um, you can see several of the, the networks there that contribute observations um, throughout the state. And of course, it's managed by the State Climate Office. Um, we were kind of towards the end of uh, joining COCORAS because we were trying to figure out how to um, uh, have both networks um, in the state and, and have them working together. And what a lot of our partners do, and including the National Weather Service, is we'll take existing networks across the state and combine them to increase the density of precipitation reports. Um, as an example, here's a map on the right from the State Climate Office that incorporates three of the networks. Um, of course, MinGage on this map, Co-op, um, National Weather Service Cooperative Weather Observers, that's the longtime climate stations. It's those stations that are about every 20 miles across the country are included in here, as well as Kokora Station. So you can see the increase in density across the state. This map just includes observers that have reported every day. Um, this is specific map is from June of 2023. Um, the State Climatology Office also uses the precipitation data, just like that map, which showed where all the data points were available to create maps like this. 
Um, we were obviously in a drought in 2021 when these maps were made, um, but they were able to be um, sub-county specific on areas that were most affected um, with the lack of precipitation. So they have a preset map from a week and also for the departure from normal. And um, you can see the detail in there on the sub-county level. We had a very um, mild winter, um, not a lot of snow up in Minnesota this year, which had a high impact up here. Um, the DNR and the State Climatology Office, they uh, kept us up to date um, with the snow depth because it's, it's a lot of um, recreation activities that are done in Minnesota based on snow. So um, they were trying to keep those maps up to date and also show the impact of the snow drought. So that's a, an example there um, of where the snow was and um, the, how deep it was. And then on the right, also comparing it to normal, uh, the snow depth, uh, just to show and document how um, how low our snow melts were this winter. Another really interesting example is from the Twin Cities metro area in Minneapolis, St. Paul. We have the Metropolitan Mosquito Control District, and they use COCORA's data along with other precipitation data from partners. Um, they determine when is the best time to drop pellets in wetlands and um, lakes across the, the seven county metro area. Their area covers about 29,000 square miles. And there's over three, th three million people um, that live in the metro area. So their, their goal is to treat, um, of course, the mosquitoes will come out um, after a significant rainfall. So they target areas to treat and when to treat, um, dropping the pellets in the water so the larva cannot develop into mosquitoes. So that's a, um, a health benefit uh, for the Twin Cities to be able to uh, treat. And another example here, Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. They use precipitation data as well from Kokoras. The map on the right shows their service area. This is actually inside the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Minneapolis is on the uh, right side of this image. There's a large um, lake, Min uh, lake Minnetonka and surrounding uh, wetlands and small uh, ponds and lakes and that, that drain into this lake. There is a dam in right here and a river, the Minnehaha Creek, that runs through a very populated area and goes into downtown Minneapolis and then drains into the Mississippi River. So the extra density of precipitation reports is helping Minnehaha Creek Watershed District balance the level of the lake um, and the level of the stream and also um, plan ahead um, for uh, mitigation efforts. And just a quick few examples from the National Weather Service. Um, we of course use the precipitation data from the co-op network Kokoraz, state observers and such. And we combine them all to create precipitation maps across the region each day. If we have significant weather events, um, this is a, an event that we had over four inches in a large uh, swath of our area. And we were able to make very detailed precipitation maps uh, showing um, where the heaviest uh, rain fell across our region. And then on the left here, it shows all of the individual reports and you can see how many of them during this event came from Kokoraz. And just a quick snowfall example. Um, you can see uh, up in here uh, the amount of snowfall reports that we received from Kokoraz observers. And this area is, is somewhat remote. So we were really grateful, uh, rural area, to have so many reports and be able to have this type of detail in the snowfall map. So I just wanted to quickly mention um, as well, there's always a need for additional precipitation observers. And during the month of March, um, Kokoraz is actively recruiting new observers. So we just wanted to share if you have um, members of your organization or if you have a, um, like a newsletter or social media, if you wanted to share about Kokoraz on there and just let people know that if they have precipitation measurements that they would be interesting and interested in sharing, we would love to have them join uh, the Kokoraz network. So I've got a link there at the bottom to kokoraz.org as well with more information. So I just wanted to say thank you again for uh, allowing me to share information about Kokoraz. And I'm sure you can tell that we are cuckoos for Kokoraz in uh, Minnesota. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, I know Kokoraz has a, um, every March, as you said, a, um, a specific campaign to get new observers and where they do a state competition and uh, with Minnesota has uh, been crowned the champ many times. So um, kudos to them. And I saw the other, other states, uh, neighboring states around the Midwest are, are hastily trying to catch up. Thanks so much for sharing that information. Thank you.
All right. Um, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, um, Al Alba Algeric. Uh, Alba is a freshwater ecologist who is really focused on how uh, human activities are impacting water quality and aquatic ecosystems. And she is also uh, the program manager for uh, the Lakes of Missouri uh, volunteer program. So I'm excited for her to tell us a little bit about that program as well as about how that data is being used. Alba, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me see if I can share the screen. Um, how does it look? Do you see it well? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk about the Lake of Misery Volunteer Program. Um, this program is a community science project that had started more than 30 years ago. It's managed by Tommy Torp, our project manager, and it's in partnership with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources and the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. The project, um, basically the main objectives are to understand the current water quality in the lakes of Missouri, uh, but also to examine trends, how this water quality is changing at this time. And above that, uh, what we do is a lot of education, right? And trying to outreach events uh, to educate the public about water quality issues. The program started in 1992. It was initiated by Dr. Jack Jones, uh, expanded by Dan Lovich and currently managed by Tony Thor. It started with a handful of lakes, uh, seven lakes in 1992, 32 sampling sites. Uh, you can see from this plot that we have grown quite a bit since then. Uh, the last count in 2022, we had 115 sampling sites and 65 lakes. So it's big. Uh, it encompasses more of the lakes, most of the lakes of Missouri. Uh, but let me tell you first a little bit about those lakes. So basically, all these lakes that we have in Missouri, the, the great majority are man-made lakes, right? So they are a little bit different than natural lakes. Some of them are tiny. Uh, they, they can be four hectares. Others are huge, like the one that you're seeing in the picture on, on the top uh, right. Um, those can be more than 20,000 hectares. Um, those are lakes that have been created because of putting dams into rivers. So this is why they have this specific shape. And a little bit complexity in something. So we can have sites that range between five and 76 meters. Ideally, what we will do is sample, sample at the dam uh, in the small lakes. But of course, in these big lakes, like the Lake of the Ozarks or Table Rock, we have to monitor several sites in order to understand water quality. Uh, again, the extent of sampling sites. So uh, those are all the sites that we have been sampling through the Lakes of Missouri Volunteer Program. On the upper part, you can see on the right side, you can see uh, a map of the ecological regions of Missouri. So more or less, we're collecting pretty much a good sample of all the ecological regions in Missouri. Most of the lakes, though, that we're sampling are collected in the plains. And this has to do with availability of volunteers, density of population, but also the physiography of the system, right? These areas where more of the uh, flat area is, where more of the agricultural land is, and where we have a lot of uh, reservoirs. So what we what do we do? We collect um, water. We ask the volunteers to collect water temperature data from the lake, uh, not only the surface water of the lake, but also we're trying to understand how the temperature um, is distributed like, along the depth uh, of the water. So they, they collect uh, water profiles. We also measure water clarity. So we want to understand if our uh, reservoir is clear or not, or it's very turbid. And then we also collect suspended sediments and chlorophyll. So with this piece of information, we're able to understand what are the causes of the lack of clarity or, or, or the extent of clarity. We also monitor for nitrogen and phosphorus, and these two are particularly important because they are the lead cause of pollution for eutrophication, so meaning that we have excess nutrients, you may have excess, excess algae. So we have recently incorporated the analysis of different forms of nitrogen uh, in addition to phosphorus. And finally, uh, another new, uh, relatively new um, parameter that we're monitoring for is algal toxins. And you probably have heard that 
we are having huge issues with harmful algal toxins, uh, those algal blooms that can create toxicity in the reservoirs. So we incorporated this parameter in 2015. We have a strong outreach moment. Uh, we maintain um, a web page where you can find all the information uh, about the uh, Lake of Misery volunteer program, about the protocols that we use, how the data is used. And then we also publish uh, a newsletter three times per year. We have a social media presence. Uh, we have public talks with homeowners associations, like owners associations, city councils, neighborhoods. Um, and also participate in outreach events. So this means going to the library to give a talk to people about what is the Lake of Vision Volunteer Program or what it means to have a, a lake with wood water quality. Uh, it could mean also going to schools or just participating in rabbit talk shows. Uh, all of that is done through all the staff that we have in, in our program. And I encourage you to visit the web page to find more information. Through this process, we we um, enroll volunteers, right? Uh, the, the condition here is that we're uh, asking them to commit to sample a site, uh, their favorite spot. And you know that Missouri has a, a huge uh, outdoor, uh, outdoors um, uh, tradition. So people spend a lot of time in lakes and uh, fishing or just um, staying there. So we, we, we target a lot of these, these communities that they already have uh, an interest in a specific lake and ask them to just commit to sample this lake uh, several times uh, throughout the summers, uh, more or less every three weeks uh, between April and September. Uh, they usually already have equipment, like a boat and all the safety equipment to go there, but then we will provide all the supplies needed for uh, collecting the samples. And they will have to collect information about uh, the conditions of the day, right? Wave conditions, sunny um, or, or not sunny, these type of things. Uh, and then also collect water samples that then we will send, they will send to the our lab and we will analyze. Our commitments, uh, basically it's providing a personalized training. Um, so part of the success of this program is that the data that we are generating is high quality. Uh, and this involves that we need to train all these still all, all these volunteers to make sure that the data is practical and uh, it's comparable between all of them, right? So our staff spends a lot of time training new volunteers or just retraining uh, volunteers that have been um, something for a long time. Uh, we have those checks, like making sure that everything uh, it's uh, according to standards. Then we will send also all the supplies needed. And another key element is the follow-up. So um, for the success of this program, after they have done all this sampling, they, they have dedicated all this effort sampling these lakes, uh, we come back to them with the results of those analysis, not only about the data on the current conditions of the lake, but also putting it in perspective of how it looks across time, the trends across years, and how they change, how do they relate to other lakes around them. So th this, I think that this, this is key, right? This follow up. And this has uh, led to have some volunteers something for 15 years straight. So which it's a huge commitment, right? So let me tell you a little bit about the workflow. Basically, right now, uh, we are getting ready to send, part of it has already been packed, uh, ready to send all the supplies to the volunteers. So here we have Tony preparing sampling supplies at his house so during the 2020 shutdown. Uh, all these equipment and supplies will arrive to the volunteers uh, by in two weeks, something like that. And then they will start sampling in late April. Uh, they will go to the field every three weeks. Usually it's a commitment during the sampling about one hour, two hours, depending on how far it is from their uh, homes. Um, they will sample, they will collect the data. Uh, they have data sheets that they have to fill. And they will store all these water samples. And then uh, our staff will go and pick them from them and bring them back to the lab, where we do all the lab analysis and data. This process ends uh, right now. So we're almost ready to uh, release a 2023 report uh, of, the water, of the water quality for the lakes of Missouri. Uh, and basically, this is a, a, a printed document that exists to all the volunteers and all, everybody interested. 
uh, and it's also made available on our web page. So how, how is this data being used? You know, the, the, main, the main data usage for this data is to protect, um, to protect and manage uh, the legacy of misery. And basically this data has been used for, by MDNR, the Missouri Department of Natural Resources to EPA to, to establish some water quality standards. The, those water quality standards are, are made possible or they, they are meant to be able to assess the water quality of the, the status of the water bodies across the US, right? So, and they are different depending on the uses of the reservoir. So some reservoirs have uh, a drinking use, others are more for um, recreational purposes. So all of these um, different uses have different quality standards that they have to meet. In Missouri, we have the numeric nutrient criteria for Missouri lakes. So this uh, the Lake of Missouri volunteer program was instrumental in providing data to come up with this numeric nutrient criteria. And those are basically criteria that respond to the Clean Water Act. Uh, so to have some type of uh, tool to assess water quality. And then if uh, lakes don't meet those standards, then they are um, they are forced or they are encouraged, right, to, to create a plan to meet those standards. So to, to make a plan to make to make the water quality better. Uh, for example, so here our nutrient crater is based in chlorophyll. Uh, and this has to do with uh, those are the rooms that I was mentioning before. So eutrophication, excess of nutrients and phosphorus in, in, in streams, rivers, and reservoirs is one of the leading causes of pollution. Uh, and what happens when we have this type of pollution, we have a lot of algae, basically. So we established those, th those, those nutrient criteria were established to, to make sure that as a, not as a problem, it's not a problem that we have 30 micrograms per liter of chlorophyll. The problem is that are the conditions that are leading to that, right? So we want to make sure that uh, everything is uh, in the standing conditions. And we have different standards depending on the area where we are, right? Because the physiology, the physiology of the system is very different. Uh, so you will see that we have different, um, different standards because uh, different uh, eco regions. Uh, in addition of those nutrient criteria, in addition of being used to, to assess the water quality and to to force or to create this plan for uh, improving water quality if uh, lakes do not meet those criteria, uh, they are also used as a screening tool. So if we see some lakes that they are okay, they are within the nutrient criteria, but they are in some of these dangerous uh, conditions, like uh, phosphorus is a little bit high, and in addition of that, we have low oxygen concentrations, for instance, uh, then uh, we, we monitor those lakes more closely, right? And uh, MDNR is able to, to look for, uh, to, to examine them more closely, making sure that the water quality doesn't degrade. The data, in addition for protecting and managing lakes, has also been used in science. Uh, so we publish all these data sets. They are publicly available uh, through the Environmental Data Initiative portal. Uh, those data sets uh, come with metadata, so explaining where all these numbers are, are coming from, how we have gotten to those numbers. And uh, they are available for scientists to use. And you know, right now we are in the era of trying to understand global patterns. And scientists rely on pieces of information from different projects to make uh, sense globally. So the Missouri Lakes of uh, Volunteer Data has been um, has been used in, in several publications. Here is an example of understanding how uh, the temperature of lakes is changing because of global warming. All of that, it's possible because the data is really good quality, right? So uh, we have been checking, we have systems in, in, in place to check that the data that the volunteers are collecting, it's a, a part of what scientists would be collecting. We have also another example, it's uh, this type of data has been useful to understand eutrophication patterns in Missouri and trying to see um, how, how the, this eutrophication problem changing across the state and across time. Um, again, this eutrophication problem, it's mostly uh, important to understand what happens downstream or even in the same reservoir in terms of alkaline blooms. 
And related to that, we have those alcohol blooms, right? So you, you might be aware that we have toxic alcohol blooms uh, are becoming more and more common across the US and not only the US, but globally. So uh, responding to that, our lab started uh, collecting a microsystem and cylindrospermopsin uh, mm -hmm. in 2015, microsystem in 2017, cylindrospermopsin. Uh, our sampling is not targeted, so it's not going to target algal blooms that are happening at that right moment, but it's just to understand a baseline condition of how algal blooms are becoming more, more, more frequent or not. Uh, so our volunteers uh, the, that uh, were on board of uh, adding another parameter to their sampling scheme, basically they, they have now an extra uh, sampling device that collects water from the first uh, 50 uh, centimeters of the, of the lake and, and to collect this data to then send to the lab to, to measure for microsystem and system. Those two toxins are uh, highly toxic for humans, and for animals, and we have there are regulations in place, right? But that are uh, advisories uh, against swimming in the lake or drinking water from the lake. So we have learned some things because of that. We have learned that both uh, both toxins are present in our lakes um, quite often, so not not at dangerous levels, hopefully, uh, but they are kind of um, one of the reverse of the other. So they are both present, but one shows up more in the prototrophic lakes and purification, like microsystem. The other one, uh, it's you have to look for it mostly in oligotrophic lakes, uh, which gives us some ideas of how can we manage, right? Or how can we target future sampling if, if we were to look for more uh, specific information about those stuff. Okay, so summarizing uh, the data that it's been collected by the Lakes of Misery Volunteer Program, it's mainly used to manage and protect lakes uh, through the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, ultimately the Environmental Protection Agency. Most of this data has been used for uh, creating tools to manage like total maximum daily loads, to manage watersheds and to make sure that water quality is met. The program is successful, and it's successful because of um, the amount of training uh, and the commitment of our volunteers that are awesome, uh, higher retention rates, and huge data quality. And again, um, thanks to the collaboration right, of the Missouri Department of Natural Resources and the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. So with that, I will stop sharing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alba. I appreciate that. Right. Looks like we have some great questions coming in. As a reminder, uh, we will spend the remainder of the session going over questions, so feel free to list them in the Q&A for our speakers here. Um, with that, we will jump right in. Um, what type of training and instruction do you provide data collectors to ensure consistency in reporting and quality of observations? This person is specifically curious about if you have a QAP, <laughs> um, a quality assurance plan, um, to administer the quality across measurements. I believe this was asked uh, during Michelle's talk about coca Ross, but it could also be applicable to you, Alba. Oh, yeah, no, that's a great question. In regard to Kokoraz, on the Kokoraz website, when an observer signs up, they receive an email from both Kokoraz headquarters and their regional coordinator. Um, and in the email, there are links to the website that where there are um, training slideshows and also videos of how to take the specific measurements and also on where to cite the rain gauge, where's the best place to, to put the equipment. Um, on the property. And it also has the contact information for the regional coordinator. Um, so if they have any questions, they can um, talk to that person specifically and, and, and get those questions answered too. Um, and also the training talks about how and, and when to report the observations. Um, I know uh, we have regarding the, the, the quality um, assurance, quality control, there's automated quality control and all the observations that come into Kokoraz. Um, and if something is an outlier, it won't be transmitted either to the maps uh, or out to the partners. Um, and there's also manual QC on top of that. Uh, so 
Um, occasionally, Kokoro's headquarters will send me an email um, if they catch something manually um, that they if they have a question about the data, so that I can reach out to that observer and clarify the the value. So um, it's a it's a pretty a good system for training the observers and then also um, quality controlling uh, the data. Yeah, interesting. Thanks. It's good to know about the manual and automatic there. How about you, Alba? Folks are also curious when it relates to the Lakes of Missouri program about, you know, quality control for the collection and how also the storage of the water samples, something that isn't necessarily applicable with Kokoraz. Right. So the quality control, basically, again, the training, right, where they go to rigorous training. We, we have our staff visiting with them, spending a the morning with them, collecting the samples. Uh, throughout the years, what we do is once they are, have been trained, we, we visit with them and we do a split sampling. So we collect samples alongside with them and then we compare the results. So they have, they receive this fact, say, yeah, you, you could improve here. Maybe you need to do a little bit better there or you're doing awesome. Um, the about the quality control of the data, we have uh, all the standards uh, set up in the, the quality control of the, the analysis. The filtering part is the the one that for the chlorophyll, for instance, or the TSS, the suspended sediments. It's easy to identify if something went wrong because the filters won't look well, right? So we have trained uh, people in our lab that are able to distinguish that. Uh, and for the for freezer mishaps that has happened in the past, uh, well, people it's very honest about when these things happen. So people usually collect the samples for the ones not familiar with that. They use a, they store them in the freezer. Uh, if something happens with this freezer, then we can have problems right with the samples. So people it's very honest. They they track uh, when these things happen. But in addition to that, we're able to see quite easily, right? So we, we ask them to, to store the samples in a specific way. If they get thawed, uh, you will see that the water has moved. Um, so then you are able to say, well, there is something going on there, right? But it's not specifically for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Someone else was curious if you've ever had to discard the data because you success, suspect it was not reported correctly. Unfortunately, it happens rarely, but yeah, it can happen, right? Yeah. Correct. Sure. All right. Uh, for both speakers, this question is from Aaron. He's curious, have you found or considered any need to consider bias in the data sets due to volunteers that do not sample during severe, harsh, or dangerous conditions? Um, he's saying, e.g., you know, perhaps during severe harmful algal blooms for you, um, Alba, or, mm -hmm. you know, Michelle, it could also be for you in terms of, you know, if there was a really extreme storm event and it's hard to get out to measure uh, the, the snow or, you know, maybe a prolonged snow uh, rain event where maybe they're not going out to measure, see what the rain gauge says at that normal, you know, 7 a.m. time that they often do. Yeah, I, I can speak to the um, the question of, you know, if we have a significant event, um, I guess the density of our maps depends on as many people reporting as possible. And Kokoraz is, a, of course, a volunteer network, so not everyone is able to report every day. So we kind of just take the observations that come in, um, quality control them, and, and use them um, in the density that they're available. But I can see, you know, a map would be much more complete if we had a lot more reports. As an example, some of the networks in Minnesota don't report year round, like some of the Mingage observers just report during the rain season. So our maps in the winter would have less data points in general. So um, we may not be able to pick up as many fine tuned details with precipitation um, over, over the winter season. So that's kind of one of the reasons that we try to recruit as much as we can to get as dense of a network as possible. Because you can also pick out um, observations that maybe need to be um, set to missing for quality control, the more data that you have, those stick out more. So um, yeah, I guess it, it for us, it probably has more to do with density and um, uh, for that question. Great, yeah. Alba, any thoughts? <clears throat> well, for us, it's, we only have data for the summer. So that's a bummer, right? Uh, because <clears throat> we know algal blooms are happening during winter too. So that, that's one of the problems. Um, also, we rely on where the volunteers are and where they are where they are willing to go to sample, right? So we may have some data gaps because of that, uh, because we are not able to reach to enough people. Um, so yeah, when using this data, 
data, we take this into account, right? And we complement this data uh, and, and you know, especially complement this data with other data sets that are available that are more targeted. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see, this question is for Alba. How do you set up the program that your collected data is accepted and considered by local authorities? How did you get qualified for the in-house laboratory analysis? Uh, again, what we do, it's a lot of, so we submit a, a co-op, a, a cooperative agreement, uh, and uh, we, we come up with the standards and the protocols together, so we receive feedback, it's, a, it's an open converse, conversation, and then we have also those split samples, so we submit some of the samples to external agencies that they are able to control that we're doing a good job, and I think that's part of being accountable, so that works pretty well. Yeah, making sure that it's reliable on that in that way in terms of multiple sources. Um, mm -hmm. Folks here are curious about your uh, equipment that you use in terms of you know making sure that it's uh, cost effective. Um, you know, are you using you know equipment like test strips or um, other folks are curious about like your sampling protocol and if that's something you might be willing to to share um, with other folks who are looking at doing similar programs. Absolutely, it's all in our web page, so they are welcome to go there and just access it to it. Uh, uh, and if they have any questions, please reach out to us. The, the equipment that we use, the volunteers use, it's very simple. It's just water bottles that have been, um, uh, that they are the specific type of water bottles that would be useful to store water samples. Uh, and then some pumping equipment that it's uh, not extremely expensive. And um, right now they have uh, also those uh, temperature sensors that they can uh, dip into the water. So the equipment itself, it's it's not extremely expensive. I would say that at most one hundred dollars per volunteer or per per site. It's an initial investment uh, that we are able to support. So that's easy. We don't use test strips, so that's that's part of the the wood water quality data that we uh, we are able to provide. It's because we analyze all these samples in the lab using expensive equipment. Yeah, absolutely. Making sure that it's reliable mm -hmm. and testing that. Um, Nathan is curious, Alma, for the larger lakes, how do you decide where to collect the data? Is it where mostly like the volunteers are willing to survey, or are you trying to cover a specific range of lake characteristics? We're, we're, yeah, it's a mixture of everything. We need the people that it's available there, but also we're trying to cover each of the arms so, or where the places uh, before the mixing. So we're able to capture, you saw the intricate uh, morphology of those lakes, right? So we try to capture what's happening at the end of each the, of the biggest arms, basically. Uh, at the smaller lakes, the dam, uh, usually it's the place that will integrate what's happening throughout all the lake because there is a little bit of water movement there. Uh, but yeah, again, we are limited for the with by the volunteers, right? If nobody's there to sample, we can go, but yeah, it might be a little bit more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this question just came in from Tony. How long does Kokara monitoring take each day? And do the volunteers report daily or keep a log and report after a period of time? They're logging on every more, uh, you know, they're instructed to log on every morning and, and uh, report. Is that correct, Michelle? Yeah, um, one thing about Kokoras um, is that it's it's very flexible. Um, of course, we love someone to report every single day if, if, if they're able, um, but if they can only report, let's say, during the summer or um, if if they can they are only able to report when they have significant events, um, they can report in any frequency that is um, it works for them. We're just simply grateful for the observations. Um, for those that do report every day, we do have a significant number that do, and that's huge help um, for climate and water year summaries. And having that complete data set is is just wonderful. So we are grateful to those to those that do that. In the summer or in the rain season, the measurement just takes a few minutes, just going out to the rain gauge and sampling, um, kicking the sample there to figure out how much precipitation fell. And then going inside, either you can report on an app or on the Kokoraz website, your measurements. So I would say it takes about five minutes each day for the um, summer. In the winter, when you have the snowfall and snow depth to report as well, uh, I would I would say about 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer if you're doing a snowfall core, or I'm sorry, a snow core or sweet. Um, that would add another five or 10 minutes uh, to that. So the commitment of the observers over the winter that report every day, it would be about 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer um, 
and the the longer part is just taking the snow that's in the rain gauge and melting it down to the liquid form so you can pour it into the rain gauge so that's kind of the additional time that's taken and going around and just getting your snow depth that's another um, extra step so about double the time um, in the winter season yeah great I definitely, I bet, is that something you do every day in the winter or only when you have new snow precipitation? Yeah, I mean, ideally every day um, taking those three measurements. There's a lot of days, of course, where there's no new snow or precipitation. So you may just be taking a snow depth measurement. Um, but those that report every day would go out and check the equipment each morning. Yeah, great. Thanks for, unless you have a, a winter like maybe some of us have had this year where we just don't have any snow on the ground for some of it, right? Um, has been uh, shorter. But yes, that's um, super helpful. I know with Coco Raz, it's that initial getting that official rain gauge up. But then after that, it's super easy in terms of making sure that you're there reporting and there is no stuff on the ground. Um, okay, it looks like we have one more question here. Uh, great talk, Michelle and Alba. Um, perhaps not the goal of these programs, but are there efforts to publish the findings from some of the data sets as peer reviewed publications? And what are some of the challenges that you face? I know, Alba, in your talk, you talked about some of the publications. Michelle, I'm not sure if you did as much. Um, anything you'd like to add when it comes to that? Um, well, I know the, the Kukaraz data is available from the National Archives. So I, I'm sure that there are people that have incorporated into research. Um, at our office locally, we do use it for um, comparing it to radar estimates. And we've used that for some of our, our local research, um, having those precipitation reports and what the radar is estimating to kind of calibrate the radar. So that's, that's something that we've used in addition to um, storm summaries. So when people are doing, um, uh, looking back at a particular weather event, they will sample the Kokoraz network as part of um, their study for that event. We cannot hear you, Anne. <laughs> thank you. I was like, oh, so, uh, so <laughs> thank you for that. I appreciate it. It looks like we have one more question that came in. Do you have tighter margins for error with a quality assurance, your data, for to greater to account for the greater uncertainty in the volunteer precision? I can speak to that. No, not really. We 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 give them to the same standards to our data collected by data students or by our scientific staff. So um again, though we go through this screening, right? So if we see something that it's suspicious or it didn't work well, it won't, we won't include this data uh, into the final data set. Yeah, you're using reliability there in order to make sure that you're you're testing with your own lab sources. All right, great. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Um, looks like that's all the presentation, the questions we have time for at the moment. Um, I am putting the, um, the email of Michelle and Alba up there. Should you have any questions that you didn't get answered today that you'd like to follow up with, or if you're interested in following up and getting involved with either one of their programs, um, as you can see that it's very useful in terms of engagement and education. Uh, within um, the citizen population, but also in terms of using that data and using that data in our decision making moving forward. Um, uh, we just as a reminder, this re uh, webinar was recorded and it will be posted to our webinar archive and you can visit our archive for um, all, let's see, 97 webinars that we've had over the, the last 10 years or so. It's at found at northcentralwater.org. And I hope you can join us next month. Uh, we'll be talking on April 10th. And the topic slotted for discussion is phosphorus management. So I hope you all can join us then. Thank you again, Michelle and Alba, for your time today.